For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to Stack News Global and Surya Gangadhar. We've been covering the goings on in Nepal for some time, and uh, it's interesting to know that in the last thirty odd years, Nepal has had no less than twenty governments. So that is something we're going to look at. Also, more important, the Indian role in Nepal. Just what are we doing there, and uh, uh, does it make sense what we are doing there? I have with me Amish Raj Mulmi. Uh, many of you would uh, know him. He is uh, the author of that book we had reviewed on our books corner. All roads lead north. Uh, it's one of the uh, seminal accounts of Nepal's relations with China. Perhaps the only one that we know of. And uh, we had reviewed it in our books corner and a long chat with Mulmi. So. Munmi, again, thank you and welcome to this uh, uh, look at uh, Nepal's internal goings on. Thank you, thank you, Surya and Strat News Global. Pleasure to be here. Great. Let's, uh, Amish, can you give us a quick breakdown on the current political situation in Nepal? Who's doing what? Uh, so right now, what's happening is that fresh elections have been called. The current parliament has been dissolved. Fresh elections have been called for November because Prime Minister Oli could not uh, find the numbers, could not find the support in the House. Uh, so the president, uh, uh, invoking the certain articles of the constitution, has called for prayer elections in November. Uh, the opposition parties have contested the decision to go for elections, citing that they have the numbers to form an alternate government. The case, uh, several petitions have been filed in the Supreme Court, and I believe uh, within a day or two, they will be, uh, the Supreme Court will issue a judgment on what next, so as to say. Mm -hmm. So is um, uh, this is something familiar, isn't it? We saw it earlier also, Supreme Court overturning the uh, earlier dissolution of the House. Yes, it did. It did uh, overturn the earlier dissolution of the House in December. And then uh, that decision was very welcome, welcome quite uh, across the board. Then two weeks later, it uh, dissolved the Nepal Communist Party as well, which is another decision that was seen as going in Prime Minister Oli's favor because they, he was getting weaker in the in within his own party. So now it's pretty much what we have is a situation where there is no longer a unified Communist Party. We have uh, the UML. Within the UML also, uh, the faction led by Malav Kumar Nepal and Jalanath Khanal will most likely uh, uh, separate from the UML faction led by Prime Minister Oli and probably form their own faction. The Nepali Congress has staked claim to the government. Obviously, that, that claim has been rejected. The, the Janta Samajwadi Party, which is the Modest Party, that is also on the verge of a split, most likely, because of their differing positions on Prime Minister Oli's government. God, fractious politics, isn't it? I mean, so many years of democracy and things really haven't settled. But let's get to um, our main focus, uh, India's role in Nepal. Now, we've been reading reports that India has kind of distanced itself from Nepal, focusing only on infrastructure and other projects. Uh, is this accurate? See, in the years after 2015, when India suffered a big setback, after its blockade pretty much failed to, let's say, overturn the constitution, the 2015 constitution that it had initially wanted, India had started focusing a lot more on connectivity and people-to-people -people projects. Uh, in, its infrastructure projects are moving ahead in uh, very well. In fact, the Umblade Ganj pipeline, uh, Raksol Umblade Ganj pipeline was inaugurated in September 2019. India recently gave Nepal about 500 crores to build roads in the Tarai, uh, to expand the existing highways in the Tarai. Uh, India is also building another oil pipeline in the east of the country. And the Kathmandu Raksol Railways, the DPR, is also moving ahead pretty well, from what I understand. But however, I mean, like, uh, what, is, what is also noticeable is that India has, uh, India has been seen to uh, acknowledge Prime Minister Oli's leadership in the country, and uh, it has uh, been seen to advise the Madesi leaders as uh, to not a faction of the Madesi leaders led by Rajendra Mahato and Mohanta Thakur to not go against Prime Minister Oli, which is where the sort of like say factionalism or the the, the discord in the Jasapa has come out from. Uh, what a change, isn't it? I mean, until much of last year, it was all about. Um, Anti Oli and uh, what he did on the border and his flirting with the Chinese. And now things have turned uh, completely the other way. What happened? 
It's it's very interesting. I mean, so I, I believe the the root of let's say uh, Bon Homi or the, where the let's say the freeze, the thaw between India and Nepal was the August 15 phone call made by Prime Minister Oli to Narendra Modi, uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on August 15. After that, in November, we saw a slew of Indian dignitaries visiting Kathmandu to meet Prime Minister Oli, uh, which was the raw chief. Uh, the external intelligence chief, the foreign secretary, the Indian army chief, and the BJP's uh, uh, foreign arm, um, I believe, uh, the foreign relations head. Yeah. All of them visited Kathmandu. And since then, uh, it, has been, it has been perceived that India is okay with Prime Minister Oli being at the helm in Nepal right now. India, was, India did not really issue much of a statement on the December dissolution of parliament as well. And in fact, showed that it was willing to do business with Oli's government by calling, uh, by inviting Foreign Minister Pradeep Gyawali for minister-level talks in January in Delhi. So there is a perception here in Nepal, as several ex-ambassadors to Nepal have noted in Indian papers recently, that India is being seen as siding with Oli in this current political, let's say, fracas. And that uh, that is leading to several, let's say, complications within the Nepali domestic political setup, as I just said. So... But is it accurate that we are backing Oli, or is it something that uh, see, kind of that's how it has played out in the media? See, uh, there are there are there is some there is some evidence certainly to show that India is not too unhappy with Oli at the leading Nepal at this current moment. I mean, uh, the best evidence comes from Mahanta Thakur and Rajinder Mahato's decision to abstain in the no confidence vote against Prime Minister Oli, which he lost, by the way. And mm-hmm. um, so, if a section a section of Janata Samajwadi Party wanted uh, voted against Prime Minister Oli, but his faction, uh, the, this faction of Mahato and Thakur, stayed away. Now, Mahato and Thakur uh, Thakur will most likely go into government with a few ministers being appointed from their faction as well. Uh, another another thing that has been addressed is they have they have addressed the Mahadeshi Party's demands for uh, citizenship by bringing in an ordinance which will last in six months, but the ordinance has been brought in that changes citizenship rules. So these, these let's say, views, these moves are all seen to be sort of catering to uh, aligning with what India had wanted from, let's say, earlier, let's say, governments in Nepal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or let's say the 2015 constitution. And I think there, uh, the key is obviously that India is not as visible as it was, let's say, in 2009, 2011 period in Nepal. But still, the, the, it's, it's become a wild card, as I've written recently, that it's become a wild card in Nepali politics, that it's become a sort of a, uh, it's, it's, its absence or its assent or its, let's say, consent, or even its lack of any, let's say, statement is being taken, is being interpreted in different, different ways. So, but what we can, what we can definitely say is that this current, this current government led by Prime Minister Oli would not be in the power had the Modesi leaders decided to abstain, not decided to abstain from the confidence vote. And in mm-hmm. fact, uh, the, the opposition led by Nepali Congress leader Sherbado Deova, they had claimed stake on the government because they had, uh, they had submitted a letter with 149 uh, MPs backing their party, which is a comfortable majority. But the president... Uh, President said that because Prime Minister Oli has also staked the government. Now remember that President Prime Minister Oli has recently lost a trust vote, despite yeah. that he staked claim to the majority. And the president basically said that both claims are insufficient, and therefore I will call for elections. So that is where the let's say a constitutional overreach has also occurred. You know, uh, there is, there has been a constitutional overreach. There is of course the larger challenge of let's say. Uh, bringing in, uh, doing elections, conducting elections during the pandemic, that of course. But beyond that, we also see that even if, let's say, uh, this, this, current, this current setup, this current crisis favors India in many ways, uh, it, it sort of, it has, uh, uh, the, the, the dominance of the Nepal Communist Party has obviously been uh, reduced. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but beyond that, China had invested heavily in the in a unified Communist Party, and that is no more. So that is obviously a setback there for China as well. China, India had also not been very too pleased with the 2015 Constitution, and 
this and Prime Minister Oli has been weakening that constitution further and further. So that is seen as another sign that is aligning with India's interests at this moment. Mm -hmm. So what are the Chinese up to? So for now, I mean, they have obviously suffered a setback. And with, with, the, with the end of the Nepal or Unified Communist Front, they have suffered a setback. But the Chinese have also engaged widely with other political parties. Uh, just recently, there was, a, let's say, the, the CCP's International Allies and Division Department. They did a virtual workshop with uh, members of the UML, the Maoists, the Nepali Congress, and a few other parties in which they discussed COVID, let's say, uh, response. They discussed basically how China could help uh, Nepal better. Obviously, all of that was there. The same day, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, he announced an gr additional grant of 1 million Chinese Sinopharm doses. So that is almost uh, 800,000 of those should be coming in today. So what we see is that China may have suffered a setback in the political sense, but it is very much active and uh, pushing forth its, let's say, interest in Nepal at the moment. Mm -hmm. And... Um in this entire interplay between um, the Chinese on one side, Indians on the other, um, has that uh, is Nepal in that sense finding a kind of a balance? Uh, you know? No, you see the thing. That's the thing. I mean, it's it's a lot of a lot of criticism in the recent, let's say, weeks has also been directed at the the sort of lack of foreign policy efforts to procure medical aid, equipment, and vaccines from other countries beyond, mm -hmm. let's say, India and China. Obviously, the biggest, the biggest setback is that India has decided to halt vaccine exports. I mean, mm -hmm. in the Nepal government has already said that it will not be able to provide the second dose of COVID shield for a large section of our population that have already been inoculated with the first dose. So that is a major setback, even if, let's say, uh, we will say that even if Prime Minister Oli has become closer to India in the recent months, uh, this is a major uh, foreign policy setback for sure. I mean, to, to not be able to resume, let's say, to not be able to bring in vaccines, not just from India or let's say uh, perhaps from the US or let's say Britain, which has the AstraZeneca stock and which we need, so that has not been able to uh, be brought in. So that is one failure over there. But apart from that, I think we are still in a larger sense seeing foreign policy as a game of two competing neighbors mm -hmm. and not from the lens of what is what particularly are Nepali interests at this yeah. current moment in time. I think that is there is a there is a dissonance between how let's say foreign policy must be executed, you know, so as to say, and how it is being executed through partisan interests, through leadership, through leaders' agendas at this moment. So so there is, that's where we are at this moment, right? So uh, going forward, I mean, last question. Going forward, uh, you mentioned that uh, maybe the elections won't happen. Uh, there could be a Supreme Court ruling. So we're looking at more uh, uncertainties down the road, isn't it? Of course, of course. I think I think it is elections. Although they have been called in November, it, it looks it looks quite difficult to hold them. At that time, so there is there is large widespread belief that they will be delayed. Beyond that, as well, I think this current crisis will go on because there are there are several things happening here. One is that the opposite opposition parties obviously they want to build up this sort of public pressure, this sort of like you mm -hmm. know like let's say they want to come out on the streets to protest the current government's let's say moves, but they cannot do that because of COVID restrictions. So that is one, obviously. The spotlight right now is on the judiciary to, and there is a lot, there are several petitions that are, let's say, arguing against the inclusion of the current constitutional bench. That is, that will decide on these, let's say, petitions uh, regarding elections, uh, of that. So, uh, unless, unless the judiciary can, uh, ensure that it is impartial, it is not, it will not be, let's say, it will not align itself to the government's moves. I don't, uh, it will be, it will continue to be, let's say that the spotlight will continue to be focused on the Supreme Court's next moves. So between these two, I think there is a lot of uncertainty that is brewing in Nepal for the moment. And politically, yes, of course, but beyond that as well, how it, uh, like, for example, the budget was recently uh, just brought in, I believe, a couple of days ago. And 
again, there is widespread belief that the budget will not be implemented because of a lack of, let's say, uh, any consensus, of the political crisis, as well as the COVID, let's say, restrictions that have been going on. So, and beyond that, also, the budget has been derided as being a populist one that's focused specifically on elections. So there is a period of, let's say, political crisis that we are looking forward to, looking forward to, I won't say, but that, that is pretty evident that in Nepal at this moment. I think it will last for another few months for sure. So, again, a lot of the focus is on the Supreme Court. If the, Supreme, if the judiciary decides that the dissolution, the recent dissolution by the parliament, by the president was unconstitutional, the parliament can again go back into house and then an opposition government can come back into thing. They, it, that may be a way out, but we don't know yet. So, so just to sum up, it could well be that India's gambit of backing Oli after all the drama of the previous year um, well, in, it may seem uh, uh, advantages at this point, but there's no guarantee it will uh, continue because if you have an opposition government coming in, uh, as you mentioned, then uh, things again could go topsy-turvy completely. And as you mentioned, the yeah. Chinese are still active. Uh, they've built up their, short of their positions there. And um, they remain a player to uh, deal with. So uh, looking forward, um, more uncertainties, and um, uh, the COVID situation, as you mentioned, is improving, but it's still high. So um, lots to look forward to. We we'll probably have to do another review, maybe a month or so from now. Uh, Amish yeah, Mulmi, pleasure talking to you and uh, get, getting your insight yeah. on what's going on in Nepal. Thank you so much, Surya. My pleasure. Welcome. Welcome.